Let's talk about Kubernetes multi-tenancy. We're gonna take a look at three different ways to do multi-tenancy. If you're just starting out with Kubernetes or if you've used it for a while, you've probably looked into at least two of these use cases, but maybe you haven't heard of or even considered the third. I'll give you a hint. I'm gonna talk about vCluster in this video, but first let's dive into what a normal Kubernetes journey may look like. Let's say you've created your first Kubernetes cluster for a developer. They've asked for it. You're like, okay, cool. I'll stand up something like EKS and, and give them a cluster. Now someone else on that team comes along and they're like, hey, let me get access to that cluster too. I need to set stuff up and use Kubernetes too. Well, do you put on the same cluster? Do you create another cluster? What do you do? Well, first, maybe you're like, oh, I can set up multi-tenancy pretty easily. And then you head over to the Kubernetes website and you check out this page and you realize, wait a minute, this is a long, this is a long document. This has got a lot of stuff in it. I have to do all of this to get multi-tenancy in Kubernetes. I have to do control plane isolation, access controls, namespacing, and all of that. That seems like a lot. So I'm just going to create another cluster for my user. Well, that's not the best thing to do because uh, eventually you're going to incur high costs and see what the real cost of Kubernetes can be. So in this video, what we're going to do is take a look at three different uh, steps that you can do to get to vCluster and real multi-tenancy. It's perfectly normal to create your first cluster and then get a request and create a second cluster. Now, by the time you get to cluster 5, 10, 15, and you start seeing the costs that are associated with it, you may be looking for a different way to do things and, and want to use something like multi-tenancy instead. So what we're going to do is take a look at what does my first cluster look like? How do I give people access to do things? What's the next step? Maybe I set up namespaces. What does that look like? What do I need to do with that? And then the third step we're going to look at is using something like vCluster, which makes it a little bit easier. And here at Loft Labs, we support it. So obviously we want you to give it a try. So anyways, let's go ahead and jump into the first thing. Okay, so multi-tenancy in Kubernetes. Let's look at three different ways to do it. So your first cluster may be everyone is admin on a single cluster. What are some of the issues with this? So it can lead to issues with shared resources. People are trying to deploy to the same namespace or maybe they don't understand overlap or like how to use namespacing or something like that. Ends up in creating requests for more clusters because as soon as someone overlaps with someone else and realizes they can't deploy something with the same name or, or something else like that, they're gonna be like, hey, let me get my own cluster. I need my own stuff. And then you may end up with too many CRDs and issues with versioning because one user needs a certain version of it and the other user needs something that's older or newer. So let's look at the second the second use case. Users are restricted by namespace. So some of the cons with this is access control and isolation requires work. You need to understand what you're doing, what you're configuring and setting up. Everyone has access to the base cluster API still. So you have to make sure that those access controls are fine tuned so that they can't access and overwrite other people's things or see other people's things. It's not true isolation unless you get it right. And then the third use case is users are restricted by vCluster. And we'll talk about We'll talk about the pros on that one. Okay, so if we go to everyone as admin, first off, first problem you're probably gonna run into is users are gonna try to deploy to the same namespace. Everyone's gonna deploy to default because they're not gonna create a namespace and then deploy to that namespace by changing over to it. There's tools out there like KubeNS and other things that make this a little bit easier so that you can always be set to the same namespace. Um, users are gonna install CRDs. It's gonna happen, right? It can cause issues due to versioning. Like I said, CRDs that aren't actually being used could just be installed and just sit around. Uh, teams could split on different tools. So you end up with overlap of different tooling when you could be on the same thing and just giving access to that, something like Argo versus Flux. Users will eventually self-manage with namespacing, but getting everyone up to speed may take time. Without good documentation, you're probably running into the same issues over and over and over again. If someone's coming on like, oh, I have to use namespacing to make sure that I'm deploying this to the right spot. Why can't I just kubectl apply? And then everyone is probably still administrator, right? So it's not true isolation or any isolation at all because they can see everything still and they can access other people's resources. Mainly, like I think the biggest issue is making sure that things don't get deleted that you don't want to get deleted or you get a creation of all these resources when you're trying to troubleshoot what's going on with my thing. You have to look at all the different things that are running in there and figure out what is important. So the next use case, users are restricted to namespaces. So each user or team gets their own namespace. So this is a great first step, but requires scoping to that namespace. So they have to make sure that they're using the namespace flag or they're using something like kubeNS and they're making sure that they're in that namespace all the time. Tuning permissions can take a while and may change based on new requirements. So you're always making sure that you're isolating for real on that namespace, making sure they can only access that. They still have access to the base cluster API. So you have to make sure that they can't see other things or have access to other things when you install them, or you may need to give them permissions to access other things when you install them, CRDs and such. Um, and should users be able to see other namespaces and collaborate? Those are questions you have to ask when you're creating this. Like, do you want some isolation or do you want no isolation? So true isolation. With enough work, you can get closer, but users still have access to the base cluster API. And, and that, that means that they're still accessing Kubernetes through the same mechanisms, which means if you do something wrong, you can have some issues. Uh, and then more more work moves over to the platform team, right? So the platform team, th this is something that's going to come up with vCluster 2, but this is in addition to all the other things. You need to set up quotas. Uh, network isolation if you want to, manage CRDs if the users are unable to install their own. So it just adds more work for a platform team that needs to take care of all this and they have to care more. They have to care like this is something that is going to be maintained, upgraded, managed. 
well, there's got to be a better way. And uh, let's go ahead and talk about that. So looking at vCluster based isolation, it's true isolation. This takes namespacing to the next level and installs K3S and K8s into a container. So users end up with their own API. So there's a different version of Kubernetes running in a container in their namespace that they're interacting through. And then that information will get synced to the base cluster. So that means they can install their own CRDs. Users think that they're administrators. Users think that they have their own cluster. With a little bit of setup and configuration, you can share to them information about the cluster if you really want to. But there's no access to the base cluster API. They're all going through the API within their K3S or K8s distribution that is installed in a container virtual cluster. Uh, it's easier to test in. Since users get their own API, they can test their own stack. They can install whatever they want. Uh, ephemeral if you want or production ready if you need it. So if you want to do something ephemeral, like you want to stand something up and run like a preview environment or something like that, you can do that. If you want to run something production, you can do that too. There's a way to install it with HA and there's also a pro product if you want to look into that. Super fast, faster than deploying another cluster. That's a con if we're talking about deploying multiple clusters for users because that can take time for those clusters to come up. With vCluster, it's super fast. You just deploy it, it comes up, it's just a container running in Kubernetes, so as fast as you can deploy a container, that's how fast you can get it running. It's abstraction that uses the base cluster to manage resources. What does that mean? That means that you're using Kubernetes still. You're just telling Kubernetes what to create. So let's talk about some next steps, right? So what are you, what are you gonna do? Where are you in your journey? What's your use case? Are you doing dev, test, preview, prod? Well, if you're doing dev, like do you need a quick development environment for users? If you're doing tests, do you need to run multiple versions of your application in the same cluster? If you're doing preview, do you need preview environments for pull requests? And if you're doing prod, are you running production workloads but need user or customer isolation? All of that can be handled with vCluster. You can do some of that with namespacing. It takes a lot of configuration work. With vCluster, you get there a lot faster. So conclusion, there's many Many ways to achieve multi-tenancy. There's free for all, there's namespaces and vCluster and other things. Free for all will lead to cluster sprawl and more work for the platform team. Namespace isolation will require more permission based work for the team and it takes more time to fine tune for your users and customers. vCluster reduces time to multi-tenancy and less overhead for platform teams. So we've got a blog post that goes over some of the best practices and if you take a look you can see there's a bunch of things that you're gonna actually have to configure. So to tr configure true multi-tenancy in Kubernetes um, you're gonna have to set up namespace isolation, role-based access control, Controls and a lot of other things that are going to take a little bit of time to get up to speed on. You can you can head on over to our blog and check out some of these examples and give it a try, or you can head over to vcluster.com and check out our documentation and see how to configure and set that up. Some of the things that you're still going to need to take into consideration are quotas and different things that you can do based on namespaces. That way you can limit what your users are able to create within their vcluster. Thank you for checking out this video. I hope it helps. I've had a journey too where I was supporting many developers trying to figure out how to do multi-tenancy right. I ended up spending a lot of money on clusters and gave each user their own cluster. I wish that something like vCluster and better namespace isolation was around, you know, like six years ago, but I'm glad that it's here now. So give it a try. Let us know how you like it. Join our Slack community. And if you have any questions or anything, just join the vCluster channel and let us know. If you want to learn more about multi-tenancy, we've got a bunch of blog posts and there's more information out there that you can find about vCluster and other tools that you can use for multi-tenancy. But thanks so much for watching and we should have another video out next week. Consider liking and subscribing if you want to see more content like this and let us know where you are in your journey with Kubernetes and what you've been working on. Well, it, it depends. So let's say you've got something like Sort Manager um, or you've got things that are mostly idling a lot of the time. Um, you, you probably don't want to have the same thing redeployed 100,000 times, but 100,000, a bit over-exaggerated, but maybe 100 times. Let's say you have 100 tenants. You don't want to have FluentD running or FluidBit or Vector, any kind of other um, streaming application, um, log streaming application running in each and every V cluster, because that would just be redundant. You would have the same configs, you would be streaming to the same data doc endpoint or Elasticsearch or Loki, um, and it would just be idling most of the time. So you would be just wasting compute and resources. Um, so for example, when you're using something like a Prometheus scraper or uh, the Fluent bit operator, the Fluent D operator, I, I don't recall properly anymore. It probably makes sense to just put that into the host cluster because especially with Prometheus, it makes just, it's just much easier to have, to have a Prometheus rule CRD that syncs into your host cluster and then in the host cluster, Prometheus just scrapes it and you have a platform team and they just have one big Prometheus instance or manage Prometheus or Victoria metrics or uh, Cortex or Thanos or whatever's out there. So, so like that's great. Um, but then there are situations where you just want to run the CRD yourself. So a, a great example for that is let's say the gateway API because we were just on the topic of, of ingress. So the gateway API is like the next step of ingress, um, but it's not a core Kubernetes uh, resource, but it's a CRD that you need to install additionally. So maybe you or your development team is ready to start adopting the, the gateway API, but another team isn't. 
So in that case, it doesn't make sense to install this one fixed CRD in the host cluster and force everybody to use the same CRD. But it just makes sense to say, look, if you're ready to use Gateway API, just install it in your V cluster and use it from within that. And then it can work. And then you can gradually start building on top of that. And you can say, okay, so now we're going to start putting the gateway into our host cluster, but you still have your HTTP route and your other resources in your V cluster. Um, so at the end of the day, you can also just do a mix between the two when, when you as an organization or you as team are ready. Um, and you just get the freedom to, to mix and match whatever makes sense and whatever you need. Because let's say you also want to run a newer Prometheus version, then it doesn't make sense to have it synced into the host cluster when you just want to have a newer operator version. It just makes sense to basically say, all right, we're just going to roll our own thing. We're not going to be syncing anymore. We'll just do it ourselves.